Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Good morning and welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Erin Weisbro and I am so excited and blessed to be your host this morning. Thanks for tuning in. And before we get started, we have a great word for you today. We just have a few quick announcements for you. Remember that this is a live Bible study and we want you to interact with us by asking questions. So as you hear the teaching today, if you have questions that arise in your heart about this teaching, Teaching, we encourage you to post your questions in the comments section below on whatever platform you're watching on today and stay tuned for the end of the live stream because we are going to get to as many of those questions as we can. And then also you can join us live right here during the weekdays. Those times that you can join us are Monday and Friday at 10 a.m., Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m., and bright and early Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. We would also like to take this time to thank all of the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. We could not do what we do without you. God bless you. Thank you. And if this ministry has been a blessing to you and you want to become a partner, donate, um, or join in with anything that we're doing here at the ministry, you can do that at any time by visiting our website at awmi.net slash give or by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Thank you again for being a part of this ministry. And then when you call our helpline, Remember that we have phone ministers standing by 24 seven. They love God. They love the word. They love you and they want to be agreed with you. So don't do life alone. That's what the body of Christ is for. That's what we're here for. We love you. We want to be a part of your life. So call, ask for agreement, share your testimonies and praise reports with us. Again, that helpline number is 719-635-1111. One, 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 one. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to our speaker today, Mr. Wendell Parr. Hi, Wendell. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and Mr. Parr is our ministry ambassador and an instructor at the um, Bible College. He is such a blessing to everyone here, and he has an exciting word for you today. Thank you very much. You are welcome. It's good to be back on live Bible study and <laughs> on this frigid morning and uh, probably across the uh, the states. Uh, they're experiencing some winter time, even though it's not officially winter. So <laughs> but we woke up to, you woke up to zero. Zero degrees at our house I today. woke up at one, so <laughs> one degree, yeah. not one a.m. <laughs> yeah, it's chilly. All right, well, let's get into our lesson today. and. You know, I think it's important this time of the year, I'm not sure why it happens, but it seems like people really get stressed out over the holidays. And so we need to guard ourselves because the enemy wants to take advantage of any time that we get distracted and, and uh, uh, forget the things that we should be uh, concentrating on and, and, and feasting our eyes on things that really are not very edifying. You know, I've been around uh, a good while. I won't tell you how many years, but many years. And uh, I've never seen things as intense in the world as I'm seeing today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's on every hand. It's not just here in the in the good old U.S. of A. It's worldwide. And uh, I, I, I just see the, a sense of unrest. It just seems like everywhere you turn, you're you're hearing of some kind of difficulty going on. And you know, if we were to use a biblical term that is often used in Scripture that describes these troubled times, we would say storm winds are blowing. And uh, we know that uh, the storms, and, and we just had a, a report of storms sweeping through Texas and Louisiana and Florida and, and the destruction that takes place. And we need to know and settle it in our minds and in our hearts that where this destruction is coming from because Jesus made it very clear uh, while he was here in the flesh in John 10:10, 10, 10, he told us 
uh, where these destructive things come from mm -hmm. because he, he announced that the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so this settles it when we see all of the troubles that are happening and the destruction that's taking place. I, I know that uh, 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 a lot of secular businesses and uh, like insurance companies and even some ministers have, haven't got their uh, facts straight and they say these are acts of God. No, mm. uh, Jesus gave us the insight as to who's behind these destructive forces. And he says, it's the thief, it's the devil that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus, right in that same verse, says, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so we, we uh, it's not uh, hard to discern what's happening. But in these troubled times, when the storm winds blow, we need to recognize that he's after, uh, there's a reason that these things are coming. Now, it shouldn't surprise us because Jesus warned us in John 16, 33, that in this world we would have some difficulties and problems. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't surprise us, but uh, too often we're, we're not ready for anything to come. Uh, and But I, here's a, a key thought, and I'm, I want to zero in on this because oftentimes we don't really uh, look at the reason the attacks are coming or the storm winds are blowing. There's two major things, and it doesn't make any difference where the attack's coming, uh, what it's aimed at, whether it's your health or your, your family situation, uh, whatever time of trouble that's coming, that's not Satan's main motive. There are two reasons that the attacks come, that the storm winds blow, and the first one is, is simply this, is to steal your faith. Uh, the devil knows that f two things that are, are absolutely certain based upon the Word of God, without faith, according to Hebrews, it's impossible to please God. Mm -hmm. And number two, Peter records this, and he says that without faith you cannot resist the devil. Wow. So whatever means the attack is coming, like I say, whether it's physical, financial, marital, whatever it is, that's not the ultimate goal of the devil. His goal is to steal your faith. In other words, this, is, this worked in the garden when he came to Adam and Eve mm -hmm. and, and had them to begin to question the Word of God. In other words, to steal their faith because they had confidence in God, but then the devil came and said, hath God said. Mm -hmm. And so today we're going to look at the, uh, the scriptures and see how this weapon is used and how we can stand against it. And remember, the ultimate goal of the devil is to get you to begin to doubt God and to doubt His Word, because once again, if he can get your faith, you can't please God, and if he gets your faith, you can't resist Him. Mm -hmm. So that's his ultimate goal. So let's get into the study today and see how we can prevent that. We need to understand that this, is, this can be prevented. So, but I want to give you a biblical example of how that works. Go with me to Mark. It's a very familiar story, but it's still so uh, appropriate for what we're talking about today. In Mark chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 35, like I say, it's a very familiar portion of Scripture, but it really sets the scene for what we want to share. It says, In the same day, when the evening was come, and this is referring to Jesus, he said unto them, let us. Now, you might want to highlight that because he didn't just say, I'm going to the other side. He mm -hmm. said, let us. And I want you to know this is a word from God. This is Jesus, God manifest in the flesh. And he says, let us pass over to the other side. So this is, this is the word. And remember, uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so now they've heard the Word of God. And what is the Word of God? Let's go to the other side. Okay. All right. Then it, and it, then it says, And when they had uh, sent away the multitude, uh, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves uh, beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose 
<laughs> I think this is interesting. He arose and, and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, just a little side note here. If you wanted to do a little word study, back in verse 37 it says a great storm. Well, that word great is one we're familiar with today. It's mega. Okay. In other words, it wasn't just a little thing. Mm -hmm. But now notice, and there was a great calm. Mega. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in place of the mega storm, there came a me mega calm. But look what Jesus says to his disciples. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So, once again, here's what, here's what we're seeing. Here in verse 35, here comes the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay? Verse 37 comes the storm. Mm -hmm. Verse 38, they question him and his word by saying, don't you care? We're perishing. Right. <laughs> That's a good confession. <laughs> but then look what happened in verse 40. They had no faith. Mm. So the storm came, uh, and in the midst of the storm, the, the, the storm was what you could see. This was the difficulty that was coming. But what the devil was after, he was able to achieve. He got their faith. Mm -hmm. So Jesus didn't just pat them on the head and say, well, if I wasn't the Son of God, I'd be worried too. No, he was asleep because he had had the word from God. They were going to the other side. Yes, sir. So they go to the other side, but they, the, the storm comes. But what did the storm do? It stole their faith. Mm -hmm. Now, look at this. Certainly Satan comes to destroy us, but until he can get our faith, he cannot do it. Now, Look at this. Go back just a few verses here in, in Mark chapter 4. Mm -hmm. And look at verses 14 and 15. Because this, once again, gives us some insight. This is Jesus teaching on the parable of the sower. And he tells us, the sower soweth the word. Mm -hmm. Then verse 15, watch this. And these are they that by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh What's the next word? Mm -hmm. Immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. <clears throat> so we see this principle beginning to work out, that when the word goes forth, the devil comes immediately in some form or fashion to steal that word. Because mm -hmm. he knows if he can get the word, he's got you. And, and when we talk about the word, once again, we're talking about Romans 10, 17, that tells us, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So at the end of the day, what the devil is after when all these storm winds, if we could use that terminology, begin mm -hmm. to blow, whatever trouble, difficulty you're going through, know that, that the devil's desire is to get you to begin to doubt or to question the Word of God. Mm -hmm. <coughs> because when he does that, he has your faith. And without faith, you can't please God. And without faith, you can't resist the devil. So now, Let's get in here and see what we can do to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, share today from these scriptures in 1 Timothy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we want to take the time to read these scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19. And now Paul this seasoned apostle, apostle is writing to young Timothy, who's pastor now, and uh, <coughs> he's been a disciple of Paul. And so he writes to him in verse 18, and he says, This charge I commit unto you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies, or we could even insert, according to the word which you have been taught, Uh, uh, according to the prophecies of the word which it went before on thee, that thou by them might war a good warfare. Well, see, Paul was writing to P Timothy, but he's also writing to us and telling us that we're in a battle mm -hmm. while we're here in the earth. And Jesus said we would have opposition. We would have problems. Now, look at the next verse, because this is where we're going to zero in. Okay. He says in verse 19, <coughs> pardon me, holding faith and a good conscience, 
which some, having put away concerning faith, mm. have made shipwreck. And then he gives a couple of individuals that have done this. So here we are in the day in which we live. We're aware of many people, and I'm talking about ministers and, and lay people uh, alike, are just basically wiping out. Mm -hmm. They're taking up offenses. They're they're giving in to sin. They're giving in to evil desires. They're they're harboring anger and bitterness and and unforgiveness. Uh, they're being discouraged and 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 quitting. They're quitting jobs. They're quitting marriages. They're quitting church. They're quitting uh, relationships. They're even quitting life. Mm. And it, it's a it's a sad scene. Yes. And yet. It's happening, and why? Mm -hmm. Well, Paul, this seasoned apostle, writing to the young Timothy, the young pastor, charged him to war a good warfare. So he's saying, we've got an enemy. Mm -hmm. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, though, that this enemy is not flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but it's the principalities and powers, or we know it's the, it's the kingdom of darkness that we're warring against. And so he instructs him to remember the prophecies or the words or the directions uh, that the word has been given to him for his life. And, and evidently Paul was concerned about Timothy's welfare and the welfare of the congregation that Timothy was pastoring. So both uh, of these letters of First and Second Timothy are filled with warnings and, and uh, instructions and guidelines of how to deal with troubled people and troubled times and and how to how to overcome them. So here in verse 19, he talks about two major areas uh, that were mentioned to Timothy to hold on to. Okay. Well, if he, he was telling Timothy to hold on to them to avoid becoming shipwrecked, then he said to you and I, hold on to these two things and your faith won't become shipwrecked. Amen. And so the, they, the first one he mentions is faith. Mm -hmm. And the second one he mentions is a good conscience. So Paul said, if you let go or you put these away, you can shipwreck your faith like others do. But if you hold on to these two things, uh, you can come through on the high side of victory. That's good. Or survive the, the storms that are coming. All right. So let's look at the first one, holding your faith. Now notice in this particular verse and in this, this particular word you use here means more than just faith in God. Okay. It's talking about a lifestyle. Uh, we're talking about, now it includes faith in God and in His Word, but the faith here that's mentioned of is, in other words, if people ask us, what's your faith? We'd say, well, we're Christians. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's our faith. It's the whole picture of, of our belief system, uh, not just trusting Jesus as Savior or trusting the Bible as being God's Word, but it's, it's the whole program. Now, faith... This faith that he's talking about is the life that a Christian is to live. And, and I don't know how so many people think uh, they could just serve God any way they want to mm -hmm. and, and, and think that they're going to make it. No, God has specific things that he has set forth for us as believers, uh, how to live life here on earth and live it as a world overcomer. Yeah. You can't just do anything you want to do and live life any way you want to live it and expect God to, to back up your plans instead of His plans. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there's no variation. There's no exemption. There's no uh, uh, partialities. You can't, you, stay, you, you can't stop being what is described by God as being right in His sight and think you can please Him. Mm -hmm. You have to obey His Word. Obedience is better than sacrifice, the Bible tells us. Mm -hmm. So we need to do what God says we need to be doing. Amen. And, and Paul says when that's put away or set aside or covered up or, or hidden in the background, you've chosen to shipwreck your faith. Mm -hmm. Now, no one can take your faith from you, but you can put it away. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Or you can set it aside. You can give up on it. But what we're talking about now, some things that are very practical things, like reading your Bible on a regular basis. Amen. 
I mean, you know, you're not going to get the Word of God if you don't ever read the Word of God. That's true. So this is, this is one of those practical things that Paul is talking about. Mm -hmm. And he talked about Timothy had known the Scriptures from his youth. So read your Bible. Okay. All right. Well, let me, let me throw another one out. Praying. Prayer. And I'm not talking about these hour-long sessions where you <laughs> tell God everything He needs to be doing and then quickly say amen without giving God an opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. Prayer is a two-way street. It's, it's communication with God. In other words, you talk a little while, but then you shut up and you listen. <laughs> This is where God can speak to you in these times of prayer. Now, Jesus demonstrated that. You know, sometimes he'd pray all night. Well, I can guarantee you he wasn't talking the whole night. Mm -hmm. He was probably spending the majority of the time listening. Yes, sir. And then he could turn around and come out and when he do what he did, he said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. Well, I believe that happened in the times of prayer. So reading your Bible, praying, uh, uh, doing the things that are so practical, uh, being a part of a church. Mm -hmm. The Bible in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 tells us very clearly, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together mm -hmm. uh, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, the day is approached yes, sir. and we need one another. You know, Paul Right, so many times, and we don't have time to look up all the scriptures, but he likens the body of Christ to the human body. And he talks about how each member of the body has something to contribute. And so that means we need to be a part of a, of a body mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, we have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes, taking Paul's lead on this, I, I talk about the, the body, the, uh, the church, the body of Christ, that, you know, if I were to cut off this finger, mm -hmm. that's a member of my body, it has a purpose. But if I cut it off, it would hinder my body from being able to do everything it does, but the body would still survive. Mm -hmm. But that little member that was separated from the body, mm -hmm. it's just going to decay and pass away. Right. Mm -hmm. Using that illustration, you know, if you're not a part or, or involved in, in some kind of body of believers, mm -hmm. if you're the one that's removed yourself from it, you're the one that's going to suffer. The body will continue, but for your sake. Yeah. And this is what Paul is talking about. Uh, be involved in what God wants you involved in. How I many of you know church wasn't man's idea? That's right. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Mm hmm and so we need to recognize that it's his church. He's building it, and the church that he's building, he says the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Mm -hmm. So we need to be involved. And this is what I'm talking about, just practical Christianity. Now, understand this. Uh, God still loves you, regardless of what you're doing. This, this has nothing to do with your eternal destination. Mm -hmm. That is determined by you accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. that, that settles where you're going to spend eternity. Yes, sir. But these things that he's saying to us are to give us a life here on earth, that abundant life that Jesus said he came to give. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we're not talking about if you don't do these things, you're going to miss heaven. We're talking about doing it for your own well-being, your own, your own spiritual health. Yes, sir. And so uh, these, these are not done to earn God's favor, they're done to keep the enemy away from us here on planet Earth. I, you know, I, at this point in time, I, I just feel like I need to give a real earthly illustration so we'll know what we're talking about. Uh, when I was pastoring, we had a couple of gentlemen in our church that, that were pilots for American Airlines. And one of them uh, eventually was promoted and he became a Czech pilot. Okay. Now, I didn't know what that was, so he explained to me that he would take, at certain times, he'd be assigned to go on a flight, sit in the cockpit, and examine how the pilot, what he was doing, and if he was doing everything correctly, and so he would grade him. Okay. And then that would, so uh, what I learned through that, and, and this gentleman kind of shared this with me, he was there to check to make sure they were doing, but listen, the fact is those pilots can't make that plane fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. The manufacturer 
uh, created it to fly. But the pilot had to do the proper things by the manual to keep the plane flying. That's true. Okay? Yes, sir. And so now bringing that into what we're talking about today, uh, God says that uh, using the illustration, I created you to fly, but you've got to follow the manual, hallelujah, That's and right. the instructions to keep it up there. That's and this right. is our manual, the Word of God, the Bible. Yes, sir. This is what God wants us to go by, and this is how faith is developed. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, Paul says, hold on to your faith. Then the second thing he says is hold on to a, a good conscience. Now, I'm not uh, totally uh, know how to explain what a conscience is, but I, I, I think of it as the awareness that an individual has of himself. And as a Christian, the awareness of, of our relationship with God. In other words, a, a, a conscience would, would, a good conscience would keep us aware of the fact that God is always present with us. Mm -hmm. He has promised He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He tells us that uh, the Holy Spirit has come to abide in us forever. And so we need to have a conscience that's aware of the presence of God with us at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And a good conscience will keep us with a, a proper attitude. It, it will, a good conscience will keep us grounded in the faith. A good conscience will beat off condemnation and guilt that the enemy tries to put on each one of us. Amen. A good conscience uh, helps keep, lead us out of evil and keeps us doing good. Mm -hmm. A good conscience, once again, keeps us aware of God's presence always with us. You know, as a kid, and probably most of you can relate to this. You, you were raised in a home that set forth certain standards of do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a teenager, sometimes when you were away from mom and dad, you did some things. They couldn't see you doing it. They weren't aware of you doing it. But you know what? Your conscience was telling you your mom and dad wouldn't want you to do that, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so a conscience would keep us from doing certain things that we knew that our parents didn't want us to do. Well, if we have a conscience, a good conscience toward God, there's things that we would know mm -hmm. that if we're aware of His presence, there's some things we wouldn't do. There's things, places we wouldn't go, things we wouldn't look at. In other words, it would keep us on the right path if we continually had a consciousness of the indwelling presence of God always with us. And, and I could tell a lot of stories about Christians that are not aware of that constant presence of God with them. But people who put that away, as Paul said in Timothy, the ones that put that away, they may think they can do or say anything, and God will not be aware of it, but you're wrong. Mm -hmm. God is always with you. And where you go, He goes. Mm -hmm. And what you look at, He has to look at. And I think this is one way that we can grieve the Holy Spirit is looking at things and saying things and going places God wouldn't want us to do. Mm -hmm. Now, once again, this has nothing to do with your eternal destination. That has everything to do with life here on planet Earth. You need to guard your conscience and, and, and keep it tender before God. Now, here in Timothy, once again, Paul talks a, a lot about, about the conscience. Look at this in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Once again, he's talking about you, if you're involved in these things and you keep practicing these things, you'll get your conscience where it's not aware of the presence of God, mm -hmm. even though he may still be right there with you. If you're a believer, you, you have seared it because you're involved in things that are not godly, and it's like you're not giving heed to that conscience. You're, mm -hmm. you're just, it's like it was seared with a hot iron. Then look at this verse over in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where we started. And he starts off here in verse number 3, making this statement. 
And he says, as I besought thee to uh, abide still in Ephesus when I, I went into Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless uh, genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in, in, uh, which is in faith, so do. Now look at this. Now the end of the commandment is charity or love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Amen. So once again, he's tying all this together, saying that if we don't maintain, hold on to our faith, and if we don't hold on to a good conscience, our faith will become shipwrecked. Mm -hmm. And he says we need to be operating out of love with a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned or fake faith. Yes. <laughs> Acting like you believe something when in practice it's not evident you do. So what do we need to do? Just do what Paul tells us to do here. Uh, and so we can say this, let, let us conclude by saying, hold on to your faith mm -hmm. and a good conscience and you can avoid your faith becoming shipwrecked. Amen. Wow. Amen. That's good. So we'll, we'll stop there and see if there are some questions that come in. Yes. But I, I just certainly want to encourage you to understand that there are some things that we need to be doing as Christians. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's not to earn God's favor, but it's to keep us on the right path while we're here on planet Earth. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. That's so good. I love how you said that this is how we develop our faith as Christians. Um, a lot of times we probably tend to think like, yes, I believe in Jesus and now I'm just going to do my normal life, but we can actually develop our faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, <laughs> once again, we, we could go down that path. We, we, we have too many people that compartmentalize God. In other words, we'll love him on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, we'll get by on our own. We'll, we'll do our own thing. And it doesn't work that way. God has a standard and a lifestyle that he wants each one of us to live. Absolutely. And to do Amen. it in relationship, connected Amen. to that vine. Amen. Well, I have a question for you, Mr. Parr. So how you said that the enemy comes immediately to steal the word in our hearts, right? Mm -hmm. So can you give us a way that we can protect the word in our heart? Well, uh, for one thing, is you just have to develop that confidence that God's Word is true. Uh, and, and the way we do that is to just make a decision that regardless of what I'm experiencing, the Word of God doesn't change. Amen. God declares that I'm the Lord your God, I change not. And then He talks about my Word will not change. It's everything, heaven and earth may pass away, but my Word is good. And so you just develop a confidence by just making a decision. I don't care what I see happening in my life. I don't care what I'm experiencing. It does not change the Word of God. Mm -hmm. The Word of God is unchangeable. And you just need to drive that stake in the ground and make that decision that regardless of what's happening, God's Word is true. Amen. And so it's just a, a choice you make. Mm -hmm. And once again, we see from the beginning, mm -hmm. God gave us the ability to choose. And, uh, you know, He said, I sit before you this day, uh, life and blessing or death and cursing and mm -hmm. so choose. And he said, well, I'll give you a hint, choose life. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. 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 He's on our side. Isn't He's he? on our side all the way. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Well, and Samaya on YouTube would like to know, um, let's see here. She was asking if there's a way, so she realizes that the teaching is about preventing the shipwreck of your faith, but what are practical ways that someone can repair, rekindle, or revive their faith that may have already been shipwrecked? Well, you just, you know what? Uh, it's a word that's not tossed out very often, but repentance is very important in the life of a Christian. Amen. That means that if we're going the wrong way, we, we just repent and turn and go the right way. Mm -hmm. And once again, all of us, whatever we're experiencing in life at this particular time is, is a result of the choices we made up until this point. Mm -hmm. So you can repent. God's arms are open mm -hmm. and he's ready to receive you back. And, and you start with a clean slate and you move on there. You know, the devil is the one that comes up and keeps reminding you of your past. Right. God's always telling you about your future. Amen. And he says, you know, I, I've gone to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. So God is, mm -hmm. is for us all the way. 
So what do we do? We just repent from where we've missed it and turn around and begin to go in the right direction. Okay, absolutely. Um, and then Vanessa on YouTube would like to know, because you were talking about here um, praying, right? And having that conversation with uh, God. And she says, how do you hear God? I pray, but it's like a one-way conversation. I don't understand how to communicate two ways. I feel so condemned that it's my fault not hearing God. <laughs> well, first of all, you have to establish a belief system that Jesus told us, a lot of religious folks haven't told us this, but Jesus told us, my sheep hear my voice. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the number one thing, you have to develop that belief in you that Jesus hears us when we pray, but we can hear him when he speaks. Mm -hmm. In other words, there, there's such a religious thing that, that only indiv certain individuals can hear God. But Jesus said, my sheep. That's every single one of us can hear my voice. And so what we have to do is determine the confidence that we can hear and then by faith start believing that we're hearing. Mm -hmm. and, and listen, when you hear, it's going to be in line with the Word of God. So once again, you can't get away from the foundation. You need to know the Word in order to be able to recognize when it's God speaking because He's only going to speak the Word. Mm -hmm. Amen? Right. And so... You just, you just begin to develop a confidence, and, they, and I, I encourage people just to confess, I can hear His voice. Amen. Because too many times, <laughs> as a pastor, I used to uh, get so frustrated with people. They'd come in and they'd say, Pastor, do you know what the devil said to me? And I'd say, so why are you listening to the devil? What did God say? Well, I can't hear God. There's something wrong with that yeah. picture. Right. And, and the picture is that religion is what I believe is taught that that. It's only a select few that can hear God. You need to confess and say, I can hear the Lord. I'm one of his sheep. Jesus said I'd hear his voice and I'm going to hear it. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. And I have found in my life that even like journaling and practicing hearing God's voice. And what do you think about, like you mentioned, being a part of a body? Uh, That's also what the body's for, right? To give ideas amen. back and forth. And I feel like God said this. What do you think about yep, this? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Amen. No well, man's an island to himself. We need each other. Amen. 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 Hopefully that's encouraging. And then Sharon on YouTube, this is kind of connected. Um, what does it mean when we speak in tongues to build up our faith? How does that manifest in our life? Well, I, for those of you that might not know, when you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you, you receive the ability to be able to communicate with God spirit to spirit. Now, if you have not received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and, and able to uh, speak in other tongues, uh, you're missing out on one of the wonderful blessings that God has provided for you and I as His children. Because when we're praying in tongues, Paul says this over in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, I believe it is, that when when I pray in the spirit, when I pray in tongues, my spirit prays. Well, what happens when your spirit, because it's born again, it's a new creation. It doesn't have all the hindrances of a messed up head. Mm -hmm. So when we're praying in tongues, we're bypassing this carnal mind and we're speaking directly to God by the Spirit of God. So it's my newborn spirit speaking to God's Spirit one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Mm -hmm. And so as we pray, uh, for most people, that's the first real entrance into the realm of the Spirit is when they speak in tongues because it's totally outside of your mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with your intellect, with your brain. It's, it's totally spirit, spirit to spirit. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 as you continue to pray in tongues, you're developing a consciousness, not only of God's spirit, but this, your own newborn spirit mm -hmm. that's resident on the inside of you. And so uh, when a man prays in, or a woman prays in an unknown tongue, his spirit prays. His understanding is unfruitful. But when you pray in tongues, you're building yourself up in your most holy faith. Mm -hmm. It's just making your spirit more aware of the Spirit of God mm -hmm. because it's a spiritual experience. It's not a, it's not a physical. It's not a soulish. It's totally a spiritual experience. So it's so, so vitally important. Absolutely. Amen. And our 
By the way, our prayer ministers that are on call 24-7, yes. if you're confused about the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, call our prayer center. They're, they're, they're there to minister to you. They know the Word. They're full of the Spirit of God, and they'll be able to give you more understanding than we can do in this short period of time. Yes, absolutely. Amen. Amen. And I really love that you touched on a good conscience, Mr. Parr. How is our good conscience connected with our mental or our mind and our thoughts? Well, once again, uh, it's a, a development of, well, <laughs> once again, we have to renew our mind by the Word of God. The, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't let the Word the world system mm -hmm. form or shape you. said, so don't be conformed to the world, but be totally transformed. And that word, of course, every preacher has probably preached it, but that Greek word for transformed is the metamorpho, and this is the process of where a caterpillar becomes a beautiful butterfly. Mm -hmm. Well, the Lord is saying you need to have that complete change, that transformation now, your spirit, when you're born again, is made brand new, but you're a three-part being. And, and Romans 12, 1 and 2 covers both the body and the soul. Verse 1 says, present your body a living sacrifice. Right. Verse 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know that good and perfect acceptable will of God. And so there's a process that we go through of, of exchanging our carnal thoughts for the thoughts of God. And... Uh, this is where we get the, what God thinks. Amen. In other words, the Bible is nothing more than God's thoughts expressed in words. Mm -hmm. If God just thought them, we wouldn't know them, but God said, write down my thoughts so that everybody can know what I'm thinking. That's good. So we need to know the thoughts of God. Once again, it comes by knowing the Word. And as we feast on the Word, our mind is renewed and we start thinking like God. And the spiritual principle is, as a man thinketh, so is he. Yes. So the more we think like God, the more like God we become. Amen. Amen. That's good. That's so helpful. Amen. Thank you. And then also, Samaya so on YouTube asks, in Hebrews 12, 2, what does it mean that Jesus is the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith? In which ways does he pioneer our faith? Well, <laughs> that goes back to Ephesians where it says, we who were dead in trespasses and sin, uh, he has made us alive mm -hmm. through Christ Jesus. And we're not saved by works. And he goes on to say that, uh, that we're saved by, by faith through grace, grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. So God actually gives to the individual the ability to believe him to be born again. So to every man is dealt a measure of faith. So this is where it begins. Uh, we don't initiate it. God gives us that measure of faith. So we can start developing that faith to believe Him for all sorts of things. So it, it begins with our born again experience when God's kind of faith is deposited in us. Mm -hmm. And then we develop that faith by studying the Word and, and exercising what the Word says to do. Mm -hmm. Being a hearer and a doer of the Word that Amen. you mentioned. Yeah, <laughs> be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Yes. So that's the complete cycle. But it starts with, He gives you the faith to start with to believe in. Isn't that wonderful? It's awesome, yeah. It's amazing yeah. that we don't even have to come up with our own faith. <coughs> no, no, yep. no. Amen. It's well, a gift. Amen. Amen. I believe Andrew has a brand new teaching called The Faith of God that came out this year. So if you would like to know more about that topic, he has Amen. that teaching available Amen. to you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this Friday morning. We are so blessed to have you. And also remember, we will be here Monday morning at 10 a.m. And if you are here local or close to Woodland Park, remember to drive through our campus this weekend. It's got Christmas lights and there's going to be a live nativity. Um, so come stop by the campus and we will see you Monday morning. Have a blessed weekend. Thanks, everybody. Amen. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.